Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Darcy Lecture Series. My name is Jane Griffin, and I am the Executive Director of the Groundwater Foundation. For those of you who do not know, the Groundwater Foundation merged with the National Groundwater Association's Foundation this year, so it is our honor to be involved um, in the lecture series and my honor to be here with you tonight. For you to learn a little bit more about the Groundwater Foundation, I invite you to stay here this evening from four to six, there will be a silent auction and also um, a cash bar and hors d'oeuvres and lots of opportunities to learn about the foundation. Um, but right now we are here to um, hear a lecture series, but first of all I wanted to thank our sponsors because without the sponsors none of this would happen. So the sponsors include Woodard and Curran, SS Papadopoulos and Associates, Rue Associates, Anchor QEA, Hargis and Associates, and Matrix Solutions. So let us all give a round of applause to our sponsors. To introduce our lecturer, um, it's Scott King is going to introduce our lecturer, and Scott King is the incoming president of the NGWA board, and we are honored to have him as our fearless leader. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the Henry Darcy Distinguished Lecture Series in Groundwater Science was established in 1986 by NGWA to foster uh, excellence and interest in groundwater uh, science and technology. It's named after Henry Darcy, whom I'm sure most of you know. And today, it's my pleasure to introduce the 2018 Darcy Lecture and his farewell lecture to us, but he still has a few more to go, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I think. Dr. Masaki Hayashi is a professor in the Department of Geoscience at the University of Calgary. Masaki received his B.S. and M.S. in Earth's Bachelor, not B.S., Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Earth Sciences from Waseda University and Chiba University, respectively, in Japan, and his Ph.D. in Earth Sciences from the University of Waterloo in Canada. His main research interests are in the connection among groundwater, surface water, and atmospheric moisture in various environments, ranging from the prairies to the mountains. He's our 36th Darcy, Darcy lecturer. I've heard him talk before, and I think this is really good tech. Good talk. So, Masaki, please come. Let us hear your talk. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Jane and Scott, for the uh, introduction. Uh, so, it's uh, uh, my uh, real pleasure to be here for the uh, farewell of uh, Darcy Lecture. Uh, so. The uh, lecture series is uh, sponsored by N NGWA Foundation, and uh, its purpose is to, uh, like Scott said, uh, foster uh, excellence in science in the science and excellence and uh, interest in science and technology of groundwater. Uh, so, since the first uh, Darcy lecture was delivered in 1987, uh, this series has reached more than 96,000 uh, people around the world. Um, so I feel tremendously honored and also humbled uh, to serve as uh, 2018 Darcy lecturer. Uh, so Henry Darcy, uh, as uh, you probably know, was a, a prominent scientist uh, and water resource engineer in the city of uh, Dijon in France uh, in the 1800s. Um, so among many, many achievements of uh, Henry Darcy uh, was uh, this famous experiment uh, <coughs> he conducted in uh, 1855 uh, in the basement of Dijon General Hospital uh, to confirm uh, the ideas that you know, he's been thinking about for uh, several decades. Uh, so this Darcy's experiment um, basically uh, set up uh, what we now know as uh, Darcy's Law. So Darcy's Law is the foundation of uh, just about everything we do in uh, groundwater. So uh, this Darcy Lecture Tour has uh, taken me to uh, many interesting uh, places uh, around the world. Uh, so today's uh, lecture is uh, number 69. Uh, I have 10 more to go. 
And most of uh, these locations uh, were in uh, North America, uh, in Canada and the US. Uh, so th this lecture series uh, you know, gave me an opportunity to see the landscape in uh, many different uh, uh, places in the United States. Um, uh, you know, many places I've never been to, such as Las Vegas. Um, <laughs> so it's my first time uh, here. Uh, so I, you know, and then I often uh, uh, asked, um, you know, so what was uh, your, um, you know, favorite uh, location among this, you know, the, all the locations I visited? Um, that's uh, an impossible question to answer. Uh, because I enjoyed every single place uh, I visited. Uh, I really enjoyed interacting with uh, local hydrogeologists, and particularly with the students. And I have made a lot of friends, uh, even in Las Vegas. I already made new friends. Uh, so uh, I, I'm very thankful to uh, National Groundwater Association for giving me this once-in-a-lifetime uh, opportunity. Um, so um, I said, you know, it's difficult to say what was my favorite, but then I have been fortunate to visit uh, a few places where I had an extra time to go on the field trips. So some of these uh, field trips were into the mountains uh, related to the topic of uh, today's lecture. Uh, but also, I went to some very interesting places on the flatlands, um, such as this uh, Karst Spring uh, in Florida. So I was astounded by this uh, amount of clear water coming out of this spring pool and the beautiful ecosystem uh, that this groundwater uh, provides. And I even got to go into a Karst Cave just to see you know, in the working of this uh, karst aquifers. Um, and some locations were good old classical hydrogeology, <coughs> such as um, the alluvial aquifer connected to a Skunk River uh, in Iowa, uh, guided by uh, esteemed uh, Professor Bill uh, Simpkins, um, who devoted much of uh, his career to uh, studying this uh, aquifer. So uh, today's uh, topic um, is about uh, alpine hydrogeology. Uh, so this is an example of uh, alpine uh, terrain. So it, you know, there's a rugged uh, terrain with some glaciers hanging over. Um, so in the context of my talk, uh, the alpine refers to the elevation zone above where the trees uh, grow, such as uh, this place in the picture. Uh, so this lake uh, in the picture is called Bow Lake. Um, uh, it's in the Canadian Rockies. So Bow Lake is uh, one of uh, the hundreds of uh, headwater systems uh, that supply water to this uh, big river called the Saskatchewan River. Uh, Saskatchewan River is the source of water supply for many millions of people. Uh, living in the Canadian prairies. Uh, so in the prairies, we look to the mountains uh, as our water tower. So the similar situation exists <coughs> in many places around the world. Uh, so this map shows in uh, the red color. Uh, so those areas uh, that generate disproportionately large amount of runoff uh, compared to uh, the downstream regions. Um, so many of these red uh, areas in the mountains and uh, downstream regions are often located in dry areas, such as Western Canada and the Western United States. So the latest uh, estimate is that uh, about 40% of world's population rely on these mountain rivers as their water supply. So mountains are the water towers of the world. So in the next slide, uh, I will show you a typical example of a river discharge hydrograph measured in a place called the Banff. It's a famous tourist resort in Canadian Rockies. So I'll just show you six years uh, as an example. So we had some uh, very wet 
years, uh, and also had some dry years as well. So by and large, the summer flow in these mountain rivers um, are highly variable from year to year. And that's because the summer flow is dependent on how much uh, snowpack is in the mountains and how fast it's melting, and also how much rain the mountains are getting. But that's only about four to five months of the year, let's say from May until September. The rest of the year, the flow in this mountain river is fairly stable, and then that's provided by the groundwater discharging in the headwaters of these uh, rivers. And especially in Canadian Rockies, uh, we don't have any snow melt or rain in January, February, March. So that's the uh, left-hand side of the uh, graph. Um, so the groundwater is the sole source of water for these mountain rivers in the Canadian Rockies. So the groundwater discharge in alpine headwaters uh, is important because it provides that year-around flow of uh, rivers. And it's important for the freshwater ecosystem. And it's also important for human water use. Um, so I took this picture uh, in Nepal a few years ago. Um, uh, this was in the middle of the dry season. But yet, this uh, river coming out of the, the mountain range in the, uh, in the background, that's called the Annapurna Mountains. Um, so this river has a steady flow of water because of groundwater discharge in headwaters. And this weir uh, in the picture is part of the hydropower generation system. It's a run of river hydropower. So this uh, <coughs> system does not have a dam or reservoir, so it has a much smaller environmental footprint compared to the ones with the dams. And it's also suitable for countries like Nepal where infrastructure and the resources are severely limited. And this type of system uh, can only function because of uh, groundwater discharge in the, uh, in the headwaters uh, year round. And the groundwater discharge also directly supports uh, ecosystem in the mountains. Uh, so this picture <coughs> was taken in northwestern part of China. Uh, it's a dry part of China, it's called the Tian Shan mountains. Uh, so again, this was in the middle of the dry season, but yet this valley floor has a green vegetation because of groundwater providing moisture input to the valley floor. So mountains are considered the water towers of the world, mainly because of their ability to store precipitation in the form of uh, snowpack and glaciers. Uh, with the climate warming, there have been many papers uh, discussing the trends of uh, mountain snowpack. Uh, if you're from California, you must have heard about <coughs> uh, the future of the mountain snowpack. Um, so in general, uh, the, the snowpacks tend to be shallower uh, in the future, and the timing of melt will become earlier. And there also have been many papers um, describing the. Uh, shrinkage, and even disappearance of alpine glaciers. Uh, so this is just one example by our Canadian colleagues uh, from British Columbia. So this paper <coughs> uh, was predicting that by year 2100, 70% of alpine glaciers from Western Canada will be gone. And we have seen uh, many papers uh, comparing the rate of ice melt over glaciers to uh, the summer uh, river flow. So this example is from uh, Switzerland. Uh, so this paper reported that about 10% of uh, August flow in the Rhine River uh, flowing through the city of Basel is provided by the glacier melt. And this and many other similar papers uh, make one fundamental assumption, which is in the minute ice uh, melt uh, over the glacier, so that meltwater goes directly into major river system without any transit time. 
Uh, so we are groundwater professionals, uh, so we know that's not the case. Uh, so transit time could be as short as a few weeks or a few months, uh, but definitely there is that transit time. So the, the big question for us, um, the groundwater professionals, is the role of uh, alpine groundwater in buffering the effects of the climate change. So in the next little while, um, I will show you some small contributions that our group in Calgary uh, has made over the past decade or so towards answering uh, important questions. But I will digress a little bit here. So many years ago, um, I was a PhD student at the University of Waterloo in Canada. And there was a, a, this you know, poster of famous nuclear physicist, Ernest Rutherford, and his, uh, his quote on the, one of the professor's door. So Rutherford uh, famously said, uh, all science is either physics or just some stamp collecting exercises. So I was uh, very naive uh, at a time, uh, and I was actually inspired by this. Um, so, wow, this is great. So the important thing in science is to uh, synthesize the, the body of knowledge and come up with these beautiful theories and equations. And many years later, uh, we stumbled upon this uh, alpine hydrogeology, and we realized that uh, one cannot synthesize knowledge if there is no knowledge to be synthesized. So for example, um, this is a picture of uh, one of our study sites. Um, so we really didn't know much about groundwater in such an environment, uh, let alone how to study groundwater. And uh, there's something like this. It looks similar, but it's a different type of geological material. And we knew little about groundwater in this type of material. And there's this. Uh, it, it's a, a bit more familiar to us. Uh, it, it's called a scree or talus slopes. So, so we go hiking into the mountains, we see these talus slopes, and then we often see groundwater discharging out at the toe of these talus slopes. But we didn't know much about the hydrogeology of talus slopes. So we decided that uh, in alpine groundwater, we had to start from scratch by collecting postage uh, stamps. So I'll introduce you to some of our stamp collectors. Um, so first and foremost, uh, this is my colleague, uh, Professor Larry Bentley from our department. Uh, so Larry is a near surface geophysicist. Uh, so he designed all our geophysical field campaigns and then helped our students interpret the data. And we had a dedicated group of uh, postdoc fellows and graduate students uh, who took this on as uh, their project and then went into the rugged mountains to collect the data both in winter and the summer. Uh, so in the next little while, I'll in introduce you to some of the, uh, these people's uh, work. Now, I would like to start the main part of my lecture with a little story. Uh, so this lake is called the Lake O'Hara uh, in the Canadian Rockies. Uh, by many people, this is considered to be one of the most, inter uh, most beautiful uh, places uh, in the Canadian uh, Rockies. So I took this picture in September 2003. Uh, so at the time, uh, our parks agency had uh, asked me to come up with this little geophysical device called the EM device to map the salinity of groundwater around a lodge located by the lake. So this is a very simple uh, routine task, nothing too exciting. So my student and I just got this done in a couple hours. And we had a whole afternoon to explore this uh, beautiful lake. Um, so I I'm a hydrologist. So when I go to a new site, I carry this flow meter. It's something you can stick in a stream and measure the flow rate. So my student and I walked around and found that there are four streams uh, carrying water into this lake and there's one outflow stream. So we measured and added up the inflow from all these streams, and that was only about a half of uh, outflow from the lake. So uh, this was uh, surprising uh, because uh, this was 15 years ago. Uh, the ongoing paradigm was that 
these places seen in the, seen the picture, um, rugged bedrock with no soil, these were considered the Teflon basins. Uh, so groundwater would not stick in a place like this. Uh, yet there are some evidences suggesting that there are some groundwater processes. So we got very curious, um, uh, but sp that sparked the curi uh, curiosity. So we started asking questions. So how is it possible? Um, what are we missing? Um, so I recruited a uh, bright young undergraduate student uh, named Jamie Hood, uh, who happened to be a very accomplished mountain climber as well. So I asked Jamie to do a little undergraduate project looking at the lake water balance. Um, so the idea is uh, we, we can measure the stream inflow and outflow, and then we can also measure the summer uh, precipitation input, and we can estimate evaporation. So if there's no groundwater <coughs> process, and then the surface input should equal surface output on average sense. Uh, so Jamie uh, set up a program to monitor the stream flow uh, throughout the summer, and we put out a rain gauge. Uh, and then this is what uh, Jamie observed. Uh, so the green dashed line is the outflow from the lake, and then blue is uh, input. So clearly, there is a lot more output than uh, input. And the difference is made up by uh, what we call a net groundwater input. So the difference between groundwater inflow and outflow. So indeed, about half of water input to this lake was by groundwater. So I encouraged Jamie to write up a little paper, and she published it in a scientific journal. So that gave us a motivation to start a full-scale research uh, project on alpine hydrogeology. So we started asking for grant uh, money, and then we purchased the equipment and established the hydrological observatory in uh, Lake Ohara. So it's located in the Canadian Rockies, and it's right next to another famous uh, uh, resort called Lake Louise. So the watershed of this lake has uh, 14 square kilometers. And we thought this was a little too big as a starter, so we decided to focus on the sub-watershed of Opabin Creek. It's one of the, the streams that contribute water to Lake Ohara. Uh, so this is what we saw when we went up to uh, the headwater of uh, Opabin Creek. Uh, so it's a very challenging environment, and we didn't really know how to look at groundwater. Uh, but 15 years later, we know a few things about groundwater in this type of environment. Uh, so we use this concept called a hydrogeological response unit. So these are different geological units uh, that respond differently to inputs of snow melt and rain. So there are several of them. At the top, uh, th this is a bedrock made of Cambrian age quartzite. It's a very tight uh, bedrock and uh, doesn't have a lot of fractures. Um, and it's um, resistant to weathering. And it, when it does weather, it produces a boulder size material. So these are rocks the size of your chairs and tables. And then we, well, so this uh, quartzite bedrock uh, is very tight. And it's analogous to that Teflon basin that was talked about <coughs> 15 years ago. And then we have this talus slope. So these are rockfall deposits from the high cliffs above, uh, consisting of those boulders uh, again. And we have alpine meadow that supports the vegetation throughout the summer. Uh, and then we have this uh, unit in yellow font, uh, proglacial moraine. So at the top of the picture, you see this Opabin glacier. It's very small and it's shrinking uh, rapidly. But this Opabin Glacier had uh, several advances um, over the past you know, thousands of years. And the last advance uh, occurred during the uh, Little Ice Age. Uh, it was about 300, 350 years ago. So at that time, this Opabin Glacier came down to where the yellow dashed line is. And then when it retreated, it left the top layer of this uh, boulder size material, the, the moraine. So in the next little while, I'll show you how we went about characterizing the hydrogeology of this uh, moraine. So uh, just hold on. I'll just uh, wind back a bit. So uh, when we do uh, hydrogeology in uh, low-relief terrain, 
Um, so drilling is our primary tool. We have so many drill rigs in uh, display at the exhibition hall. So we can bring one of those things and then uh, drill a hole and look at the sediments and uh, cores and then put a monitoring well to understand the groundwater. But we didn't have that luxury in this uh, place. Uh, first of all, uh, to, to fly one of those things using a helicopter would be very expensive. And um, this is supposed to be the crown jewel of the Canadian Rockies. So our parks agency would never allow us to drill in a place like this. So we decided to take an uh, alternative approach. Um, so looking at the interaction between surface water and the groundwater to gain some insights on groundwater. So there are a couple of interesting surface water features on this uh, terrain. So one is the source spring of uh, that Opavian Creek. Uh, so that provides about 80 to 85 percent of water going down to Lake O'Hara uh, through Opavian Creek. And that's located at the toe of uh, Pro Glacial Moraine. And there's this Opavian Lake uh, at the top left corner. So one side of the lake is uh, blocked off by this tight Cambrian quartzite. And then the other side has this moraine. So in the next slide, I will show you the discharge hydrograph of this uh, source spring. So we observed uh, high flow and highly variable flow during the snow melt period, uh, which ended about early August. And then after that, there was a, a steady period uh, punctuated by responses to a few summer storm events. So this steady part is uh, showing the, the discharge of snow melt water that was once stored as uh, groundwater. And then this is the water level in the Opavian Lake. Uh, there's a strong correlation between the lake level and the discharge. Uh, and then there's no surprise here. Uh, th this is Darcy's law. So the lake level goes up. And that increases the hydraulic gradient. And then that pushes the uh, uh, large amount of flow from the spring. So what this tells us is that there was a hydraulic connection, or the pathway of groundwater between the lake and the spring. It also means that there are other pathways of groundwater under the moraine. So we really needed to see the internal structure of this uh, moraine. But again, we're working in a place like this with no opportunity to drill. So we decided to use uh, geophysical methods. So we used uh, a number of methods. Uh, the one method we used is uh, electrical resistivity tomography. So in this method, we put uh, two electrodes. Uh, these are basically nine-inch nails uh, into the, the ground and they inject a current from positive to negative electrode. And so that generates a voltage field. And we use many dozens of other electrodes to measure this voltage field and then repeat this measurement many, many times. And from the large amount of data, um, we can construct a tomographic image of the subsurface distribution of resistivity. So this is, a, this is kind of similar to uh, the CAT scan uh, technique used in medical diagnostic. And we also use the seismic refraction tomography. So this student in the picture is hitting a plastic plate with a big sledgehammer to generate a mini earthquake. And we use many geophones to uh, monitor the propagation of a seismic wave. And from that data, uh, we can construct a tomographic image of seismic velocity. So in the next slide, uh, I will show you the seismic result for the red line in the middle of this uh, moraine. So the blue indicates a low seismic velocity. Uh, it's a loose material, in this case, the moraine. And the yellow and the orange indicates high seismic velocity, so it's a, a, a quartzite bedrock. And the black lines indicate the theoretical pathways of uh, seismic waves. So we saw that there was about 20 to 25 meter of the moraine over the irregular surf, uh, surface of uh, the bedrock. And then this is the resistivity results um, uh, along the same line, a little bit longer. Uh, so the blue color indicates uh, low resistivity. So this is a, a material that conducts electrical current relatively easily. And the orange and the red indicates high resistivity. So in, in this environment, uh, the high resistivity indicates either dry material or frozen material. 
And then low resistivity indicates the presence of uh, liquid water. So the highest uh, resistivity was observed at the left end of the, the section. And it happens to be a place where we have this massive slab of ice covered by a meter or two of uh, boulders. So it's a debris covered ice or buried ice. And it's an extension of uh, the Opavin Glacier that's exposed. Uh, so this is a part of the glacier, but it's covered by debris. So it has an implication on the mountain water resources. Uh, so when we talk about shrinking glaciers, uh, we always use this remote sensing techniques that only captures the exposed ice. So it's possible that in front of the shrinking ice glacier, there could be a, a large volume of ice left. And we also saw uh, these orange blobs, the um, you know, blobs of um, moderately high resistivity. So in addition to geophysical measurements, uh, we uh, put out auto-logging temperature sensors uh, on the ground surface in the fall. And then these sensors were covered by thick snowpack, you know, 10, 15 feet uh, thick snowpack. And then this sensor kept measuring the temperature. So the Temperature of ground surface in winter measured under the thick snowpack is a good indicator of the presence or absence of a permafrost, so the permanent body of ice. So based on these data, we concluded that uh, these orange blobs are permafrost, or we also call it the ground ice. So this is different from massive slab of ice. Uh, so these are blocks of ice that are cementing the rock fragments. Uh, so both buried ice and ground ice are impermeable to uh, groundwater. And in the middle of the section, uh, we saw a yellow to blue transition, indicating a dry to um, wet transition. So all geophysical methods, no matter how well we do it, uh, they have limitations. Uh, so the limitation of resistivity method in this environment is that when we have a uh, high resistivity layer, which is the yellow part, uh, overlying the low resistivity layer, so the high resistivity layer blurs the resolution of the low resistivity layer underneath. So we could tell there was something wet. But we couldn't tell if that wet zone was one meter thick or 20 meter thick. So we needed to bring in an independent line of evidence to estimate the thickness of this wet zone. Uh, so we're fortunate to uh, bring in our friends from Switzerland to conduct a nuclear magnetic resonance uh, imaging. So this technique uh, gets the uh, liquid water molecules shown in blue in this picture. So they showed us that this wet zone is rather thin, maybe a couple of meters, and it's saturated. And this thin saturated zone was sitting on top of the bedrock surface we detected using the seismic method. So bringing in all these different lines of evidence, um, so this is uh, our conceptual model of groundwater in the moraine. So you can see this as the very first post-stage stamp uh, that uh, we collected. So we have uh, Opavin Glacier, exposed part of glacier uh, to the very left, and the part of the glacier is covered by debris. And then we have some uh, permafrost in orange. Um, so both permafrost and then uh, uh, massive ice are impermeable, so we have little ponds called the tarns perched up on the glacier or shallow perched uh, groundwater. But this permafrost has a lot of gaps, so that allows groundwater to flow downward and hit this irregular surface of uh, bedrock uh, over this you know, <coughs> tight uh, Cambrian quartzite. So the groundwater flows sideways and find the lake and also the spring. Uh, so when the uh, ground surface intersect the water table, um, shown in about two thirds uh, of, to the right of this picture, um, we, we have some ponds, again called the tarns. Uh, so it was, you know, satisfying to um, understand qualitatively, uh, you know, this uh, groundwater in the moraine. But this was just one of many hydrogeological response units. So we had many more to characterize. 
And then I just used a few slides to show you how we went about getting this post-stage stamp, just so I could demonstrate how one can do hydrogeology in a challenging uh, environment. Like I said, though, uh, there are many more to work on. So uh, um, this is another example of an alpine meadow. So in the Canadian Rockies, uh, alpine meadows uh, typically occur with uh, talus slope. So th there's an alpine meadow in front of talus slope. Uh, so we did a lot of geophysical measurements and surface water, groundwater measurements. Uh, one of the interesting things we found was this. Um, it's a map of a bedrock surface elevation. Uh, so the ground surface is rather flat, but underneath there's a bowl-shaped basin of uh, bedrock about five or six meters deep. And at the bottom of this map, um, so bedrock actually has a sill, um, so elevated part. So it, it acts like a subsurface dam. So this subsurface dam uh, was keeping the water table reasonably close to the ground and, and providing moisture to these uh, plants uh, growing in the meadow. And it's not just plants. Uh, so we, when we go out there in the summer, we see animals such as pikas and marmots eating grasses here in the meadow. So this subsurface dam and the groundwater kept by this subsurface dam provides a unique ecological niche in the fragile alpine system. So here's another post-stage stamp. Um, conceptual model of talus and meadow hydrogeology. From the left to right, so we have uh, high bedrock cliffs, very steep. So the snow melt water and the rainwater just goes down the cliff and enters this uh, coarse material of talus. And the groundwater flies over this irregular surface of a bedrock and then gets into the saturated sediments of meadow or sometimes it pops up at the toe of talus slopes as a spring. And then subsurface dam, just keeping the groundwater uh, on the right-hand side, was uh, important <coughs> for this system. And it turns out this subsurface dam uh, is a common feature in many mountain ranges. Uh, this is an, a recent example by our colleagues from University at Buffalo, working in Yosemite National Park in Sierra Nevada. So they showed, using similar techniques, that, that these bedrock features are very important for keeping the groundwater there and keeping the meadow ecosystem intact. And it's not just North American continent. Um, over the past 10 or 15 years, our uh, fellow stamp collectors from around the world have accumulated some uh, similar evidences. Uh, so the first one is from Bolivia. Again, you see a talus meadow, and then that's feeding the creek uh, flowing uh, through the meadow. And then this one is from Bolivia, the work by our colleagues uh, from McGill University in Canada and the Syracuse University in uh, New York. And then this is uh, the one uh, I was involved in Switzerland. Again, there's a big talus slope and there was a big spring of groundwater coming out at the toe of this talus. Um, so, um, and the, these are uh, some of the examples of uh, different uh, alpine <coughs> hydrogeological response units. And then the latest uh, one uh, we have been working on is uh, this. Um, so it's located about 20 miles uh, north of uh, Lake O'Hara. Uh, the similar geology, the Cambrian quartzite, and it's called Helen Creek. Uh, so the there's a Helen Creek draining this watershed, and a particular unit uh, we are examining is this. <clears throat> it's called a rock glacier. It has this, you know, characteristic wavy uh, surface. Um, and this uh, rock glacier looks like this uh, on the ground. Um, so many thousands of years ago, uh, estimated to be about 20 to 21,000 years ago, ice glacier came through this valley and curved this U-shaped valley and scraped off all the sediments. And after that, there was another cold period, about 13 to 14,000 years ago. So around that time, there were this you know, rock fall uh, <coughs> deposits coming in from the right. And then 
uh, close to the uh, back of this picture, you see an example of fresh uh, rockfall deposit. So, so all these rockfall uh, deposits were mixed in with a large amount of snow, and the snow became ice. And a mixture of ice and rock fragments uh, became heavy enough and started flowing down slope from the right to the left. And then when this ice melted, uh, it left this characteristic landform of a rock glacier. So there may not be any ice left uh, in this pile of rocks, but we still call it a rock glacier. So we um, did a lot of geophysical measurements, uh, and then we again saw that uh, groundwater was sliding over the bedrock surface under about 30 or 35 meter thick rock glacier. But instead of coming to the creek, uh, groundwater was intercepted by this lateral collector. And uh, so this collector was routing groundwater to a single point uh, where it discharges as a spring. Uh, this spring uh, flows year around and it keeps the temperature between 0 0.5 and 3 degrees Celsius throughout the year. So this spring provides a stable flow and a stable temperature of Helen Creek, a downstream of this location. That has a tremendous benefit to the uh, freshwater ecosystem. So this is another postage uh, stamp. Uh, so <clears throat> bedrock, talus, and uh, rock glacier from left to right. So the meltwater goes down uh, to talus, and then groundwater is uh, flowing over the bedrock surface from talus to rock glacier. And then that downslope groundwater flow is intercepted by this ridge of glacial till. So this is uh, sediments left by ice glacier. And that contains a clay size material, so it has a much lower hydraulic conductivity. So that forces the flow sideways until uh, Groundwater finds a breach in the ridge and then pops up as a spring. And then to the very right is the main channel of uh, Helen Creek. So to our surprise, there are actually small ice patches in both talus and rock glacier. So it seems that there are a few localized spots where the energy balance is cold enough to keep ice intact even under the warm climate of the present day. So in the next slide, I will show you the discharge hydrograph of a rock glacier spring, and also the main channel of Helen Creek measured right above the rock glacier spring. So the black bars indicate daily precipitation, and the map shows the aerial extent of the contributing areas of uh, main channel in red and rock glacier spring in blue. So during the summer months, when the hydrology of this stream is dominated by rainfall and snow melt, the amounts of flow were roughly proportional to the size of contributing areas. And then there's no surprise there that this is what we expect. But the situation changed in the late fall. The Rock Glacier Spring started to dominate the flow of Helen Creek. And when we go out there in the middle of winter, we see that the main channel is almost dry, but the Rock Glacier Spring provides the steady flow of groundwater to Helen Creek. Again demonstrating the importance of this uh, coarse uh, material in keeping groundwater and releasing it uh, throughout the year. So the rock glacier is a common feature uh, in the mountains around the world. Uh, so for example, this is uh, one from uh, China, uh, the northern edge of a Tibetan plateau. So it's a very cold place, well within the permafrost zone. So it's expected that this rock glacier still has lots of ice. Uh, it may even be flowing. So th this is an example of what we call active uh, rock glacier. Uh, so the left uh, picture uh, shows my Chinese colleague standing at the toe of this rock glacier, looking at the groundwater discharging out of this uh, rock glacier. And then there are many relict or inactive uh, rock glaciers, such as the one uh, we studied uh, in Helen Creek. So this is an example from a <coughs> rock glacier in uh, Austria. So this, this picture was taken during my Darcy tour. Uh, thank you again for giving me an opportunity to visit you know, these beautiful places. And so anyway, so this rock glacier, uh, on, on, uh, picture to the left, is very old. 
And some part of Rock Glacier is so old that the trees are even growing. Uh, but yet, this uh, porous structure provides the storage and release of groundwater. Uh, so it is satisfying and important to characterize the hydrogeology of uh, these different units. Uh, but that's not really what we are interested in. So we are interested in the collective behavior of all these different hydrogeological response units in controlling the hydrology of watersheds. Uh, so the idea is that we have different sources of water coming in at a different timing and magnitude. And then they all go into temporary storage of groundwater, and then when they come out, the signal is somewhat modulated. So we want to quantify the process of this signal modulation. So we decided to look at the water balance of uh, Opabin uh, watershed. Uh, so this turned out to be a, a challenging exercise again. Uh, so in the flatland hydrogeology, uh, precipitation input is one of the easiest things to measure, at least in principle. But that's not the case in the mountains. Uh, for example, this is the distribution of uh, amount of snowpack uh, expressed as the amount of water melted. It's called a snow water equivalent, just before the melt started in 2008. So there's a very large spatial variability of uh, water input, availability of water. And then on top, the snow melt rate in the mountains is controlled by solar radiation. And the solar radiation has a high spatial variability because of shading. So for example, this is um, output from our calibrated uh, radiation model, and you see <coughs> many, many uh, differences uh, depending on where you are. So we needed to take into account all this spatial variability, so we took a brute force approach. So we set up physically based, uh, detailed uh, snow melt energy balance model. It's called the Utah energy balance. Uh, we set it up on 25 meter grid cells. So there are hundreds of grid cells on this map. And then using this, we computed hourly rate of snow melt for individual grid cells, and we added them all up to generate this uh, figure. So each bar represents the daily input of snow melt or rain. Uh, and then, uh, well, there's a, actually a glacier melt output, but it was just too small to be shown in the uh, chart. And this orange line is the output. So clearly, there is a delay in output, and we can use this cumulative chart. So each day, we add both input an output on this uh, blue and orange line. So again, it demonstrates a delay in output. At the peak, there was about 100 millimeter of uh, difference, or four inches of uh, difference. So this indicates that there's a groundwater storage. Uh, and then we use this uh, simple bucket to conceptualize this groundwater storage. Uh, so we don't really know how deep this bucket is. It could be very deep. But we do know that there's a spigot at about 100 millimeter from the top of this bucket. So this top part of the bucket, uh, we call it the active uh, groundwater storage. And then we get about 900 millimeter of uh, water input in summer by snow melt and rain. So this top part of the bucket is flushed uh, several times over the summer months. And then when the fall comes around, the bucket is always full. So that full bucket allows a small amount of groundwater discharge, uh, about 0.3 millimeter per day in Lake O'Hara, uh, to sustain over winter. It's a small but in important amount for freshwater ecosystem. And then there is this bottom part of the bucket, which we call a stagnant groundwater storage. Um, again, we, we don't know how deep this bucket is, but we do know that exists, and then it's mixed in with this active uh, groundwater storage based on chemical and isotopic signatures. So what we learned from this exercise is that alpine groundwater turns out to be not important at all. It's uh, negligible when we talk about the magnitude and timing of uh, peak flow. But it's only about four to five months of the year the rest of the year, alpine groundwater is very important because it controls that year-round flow with having that small amount of storage. So the next step is to translate this uh, scientific findings, which is primarily of academic interest, 
to something that matters uh, to society, such as the behavior of large river basins. Um, you know, that's relevant to irrigators, uh, water supply managers, uh, hydropower generators. So we've been working on that for the last couple of years. Uh, so in Canadian Rockies, our Water Survey of Canada monitor river flow year round. Uh, so we picked 18 river basins using this criteria. The top one is most important. So these are unregulated, no dams. And then we analyzed <coughs> the historic uh, stream discharge uh, data. So I'll just show you one example from a river called the North Saskatchewan River. So this graph um, uses a normalized flow as a unit of uh, discharge. So, so we can compare the large and the small river basins. Uh, there are 40 gray lines indicating individual years. Um, uh, like uh, we saw earlier, there's a large variability in the summer flow. But winter flow is fairly stable from year to year. So we calculated average flow in January and February and called it winter flow. So in the next slide, I will show you year-to-year -year variability of uh, winter flow uh, for a few river basins as a, an example, just three of them. So we saw some interesting things. Uh, so first of all, all 18 river basins uh, have had a remarkably similar amount of winter flow, about 0 0.2 to 0 0.6 millimeter per day. That's consistent with our measurement at Lake O'Hara Hydrological Observatory. That was a 0 0.3 millimeter per day. And we ran some statistical analysis, and there's no trend uh, in winter flow over the past uh, half a century or so. Even though these river basins have seen the shrinkage of glaciers and rising temperatures. So based on this data, so at least in the Canadian Rockies over the past half century or so, uh, groundwater in the Alpine appears to buffer the effects of uh, climate change. So I'll just use this slide to summarize uh, my talk. Uh, so this year-around flow in mountain rivers uh, is important both for environment and for human water use. And based on the work by our colleagues, uh, uh, it seems that these core sediments, such as talus, moraine, and rock glacier, are the primary reservoir of uh, groundwater, except in cases where we have well-developed karst network or intensely weathered or fractured bedrock. And we do know something about internal structure and processes in this type of sediments. With this, uh, we can come up with the hydrological parameterization, such as the nonlinear relationship between groundwater storage and discharge at a scale of small watersheds. So once we get this sort of relationship, we can put that into a large river basin models to talk about impact of climate change on base flow of these uh, rivers. So uh, I'd like to conclude uh, with a, a few thoughts. Um, so uh, this uh, major research on alpine hydrogeology started with a spark of curiosity, uh, just like a lighting, lighting a match. So to advance our understanding of uh, groundwater, uh, sometimes it's worth pursuing this spark of uh, curiosity. And, and to do that, uh, we don't really need a big experiment or expensive equipment. Uh, with a bit of ingenuity and a persistence, uh, we can make some interesting scientific discoveries or meaningful contribution to society. And lastly, uh, this project, just like many others, was <clears throat> the work of um, many people bringing different ideas from different disciplines. Uh, so so my, my experience uh, working on groundwater over the past couple of decades is that it's this collaboration that makes this uh, science uh, more fun and interesting. So I'd like to uh, emphasize that you know, uh, it is important to collaborate, especially with the folks from uh, different disciplines. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions.
When I saw the discharge coming out of the uh, uh, rock glacier, it looked like it was in one spot. Do you have any clue as to what would control that? I was, could imagine it being more diffuse, like a little wetland or something. Yeah, good question. So the uh, actual pathways of uh, groundwater through uh, the rock glacier is uh, fairly complicated. So there are probably many pathways coming down the slope. But that downslope flow hits this uh, relatively impermeable material. That's a glacial till. So instead of coming through the glacial till, uh, so groundwater is forced to flow around uh, along this glacial till ridge. And then there's a, a breach in the, uh, the ridge of glacial till. So that's where the groundwater is all coming out in a single, single place. So it takes that you know, internal structure to force that flow. Hi, nice presentation. I will ask you a dumb question first. So with the climate change, there's a temperature increases, and then that means water is evaporating more. So is that water leaving Earth, or is it still, again, deposits back on Earth? That's the first question. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for bringing that point out. So Alpine is a unique place uh, in terms of hydrology. There are two things that make Alpine unique. One is a higher amount of precipitation because it's higher in elevation. The second important point is no vegetation uh, because there's no soil, so no trees or grasses, uh, some grass patches. So that means evaporation has a minip minimum impact. Once the rock gets dry, which happens very quickly, so that cuts off any evaporation flux. So overall, water stays constant, or? Pardon me? Overall, the water in Earth is, are we losing water because of climate change or not? Yeah, um, so it really depends on uh, uh, each region of the world. Uh, for example, in the Canadian Rockies, uh, so the latest model prediction is that we will we'll have a 20% increase in uh, precipitation. So we'll see more water but it's just a timing, so it'll probably come in as rain rather than snow. So that's when things get really complicated, so we need to talk about storage of that uh, water. Great talk, very interesting. Question on water chemistry. Did you see any difference in major ion chemistry from the water coming through the the rock glacier or the talus versus the streams. On one side, you would think that the increased surface area of all the crunched up rock there would, would tend to create a higher, you know, dissolved solids. But on the other side, so much water has probably flushed through that over the last several tens of thousands of years, it might have just flushed it all out. So I was curious. Yes, we do see differences. Uh, again, it's a specific to specific watershed, but a particular watershed. So the water coming through the moraine picks up uh, some carbonate. So it tend to have a higher total dissolved solids compared to uh, the water coming through talus. Uh, so whatever reason, there's a difference in geological material. So talus water tends to be much fresher than the moraine water. So it's a good you know, way to distinguish the sources. Yeah, hi. My question is, um, why, why is it buffering why is the base flow buffering climate change? With, with climate change, you would think there'd be just more meltwater in the system, so therefore that base flow would increase. Is it a storage issue? Is it just the amount of storage in those talus slopes? Or how come that's not getting more? Yeah, uh, so in this case, uh, so buffering is um, used to indicate the ability of this streams to sustain uh, water during the dry period and uh, winter. So the, the, the common notion uh, is that once the glacier is gone, uh, so then they use that part of bank account. So the glacier bank is gone, uh, so then there's no saving there. 
But then, in fact, uh, there's other uh, bank accounts there. So the groundwater plays a role in just storing that snow melt water uh, over the summer and then just making it available for winter and the fall in uh, um, environment like uh, US and uh, Canada. Uh, so that, that's what uh, I refer to as uh, buffering. Uh, so I'm bu talking about buffering against the depletion rather than buffering against the increase. Okay, thanks. Um, have you thought about using drones to do LIDAR snapshots and comparisons and mass balance? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Um, so, um, yes, uh, we are working with our colleagues uh, using a drone for uh, several different purposes. Uh, the one, one thing we do is a drone equipped with a device called a LiDAR. Uh, so that's a device for getting high resolution measurement of elevation. So back in those days uh, when I you know, showed this uh, picture of snow water equivalent, that was done by foot. So we had uh, many students walking around measuring snow depth at the thousands of points. Uh, but now with the LiDAR, we just get the snow surface and then ground surface elevation from difference, uh, you can get the snow. So yes, LiDAR and drone is a very useful technology. Oh, thank you. OK. Thank you, Dr. Hayashi. Um, as you saw from Masaki's slide of where he went this year, it's a tremendous commitment that uh, our Darcy lecturers take on when they take on this, this uh, opportunity. And uh, in appreciation of all the effort that you've done, the students you've talked to, and the places you've been, thank you very much on behalf of the National Groundwater and the Groundwater Foundation. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a, a few minutes, moments break, and then we'll come back with the McElhaney lecture. Oh. Kathy has indicated there's something to say. For those of you who need a code, <laughs> it's 18SM18. Everybody got it? We'll see you back here in 20 minutes. <laughs>